everyone. Um, in this election, so many political adverts are deliberately misleading and some even patently dishonest. Following this election, do you think that the incoming government should amend some of the laws surrounding political advertisement? Simon, I'll go to you on that. Well, my personal view is uh, absolutely. I, I think it's outrageous that the whole rest of the advertising industry, if they say something even slightly inaccurate about a beer, let's say it's got vitamin A in it and it doesn't have vitamin A, they are going to be fined, they're going to be slammed, it's going to be taken off air. But that's a trivial issue. What about uh, the whole country's future? They're allowed to say what they like. I think it's, it's absolutely crazy. Now, one of the reasons I feel that they're allowed to is it looks so difficult to police it. How would you stop them? And uh, I think that's the challenge is if we, I'd, I'd love to see some kind of body, uh, perhaps three judges, three federal judges looking at each ad prior to, to it going and, and giving a tick off for, that, it, that it seems like uh, it's, it's right for the nation to see, something like that. But it needs some kind of body to oversee this advertising. Mm. We're going to talk as well about the effectiveness of ads and of course you're well known for one very effective ad. If you're of my age, or you'd, you'd certainly remember this ad. For those not, let's have a little look. <laughs> But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. The fact is, over 50,000 men, women and children now carry the AIDS virus. That in three years, nearly 2,000 of us will be dead. My question is for Paul Fletcher. Oh. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> My question is for Paul Fletcher, but we'll come to that in just a minute. Simon, when you look at that, uh, that was a very effective ad, but it was designed to scare us mm -hmm. as well. Mm. How, when we talk about political advertising, what is that sweet spot between me uh, information and message and impact? That's a great question. And the reality is this, that if you look at uh, either side's advertising, it's information-led but it doesn't really have the emotion that I feel that advertising should have. Now, there's a presumption, I think, uh, in the marketing of both parties that we're all very interested in what they've got to say. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, you know, I, I truly am a, a fan of, of politicians in general. I think the vast majority got the, uh, their heart in the right place. They work exceedingly hard having, having watched them up, up close. But the truth is, that Australians aren't that fascinated with mm -hmm. this election most of the time. The truth is that we're as worried about our, our, our daughter's cold or uh, our azaleas uh, growing dead or the, the fact that, you know, I'm hungry and I want to, I want to have dinner uh, while we're watching these ads. And therefore, these ads fail, in my view, because mm -hmm. they inform, but they don't impact. Does, does fear win over hope? Uh, it, just, it does, in general. Does. In fact, the, the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist uh, Daniel Kahneman showed that it is almost two times as powerful to talk about fear. Fear of loss, loss aversion as he called it, is much more uh, impactful. So as an example, you would be much more motivated to avoid losing $1,000 than you would be to at the, the possibility of gaining $1,000. So uh, a lot of the political ads are talking about a rosy future, and, and I can understand why, because you don't want to be all misery guts uh, when, it, when it comes to your advertising. But at this late stage, when we're trying to persuade undecideds, I think fear is a much stronger way of doing that. Intifar, uh, are youth looking for fear or hope? I actually would take a step back and I actually disagree. I, I don't think uh, it's, it's about fear or hope at the moment for young people. I feel like young people are more critical at this, uh, today's young people are more critical than their parents, let's say, or, the, or their grandparents. And they understand misinformation or disinformation or they understand what's happening. I think they're just after the truth, the reality, integrity. That's what they're after. Even when, when, when I turn on the TV, oh, well, I don't turn on the TV, let's say, when I'm on the internet. <laughs> You're on TV tonight. <laughs> yeah, I am on TV today. Uh, but when I'm on the internet, these yeah. ads, they are deterring. They deter you from politics. That's so, really interesting too, because yeah. how you get your information is different. As you say, not on television. Yeah. My, my children are the same. They'll be watching it on the internet. They'll be watching clips 
on on YouTube or Facebook. Little bites, yeah. absolutely. So I think the more the most important thing is who is the audience, and I tell this to my political science students as well when they write an essay. Like when you're communicating, you want to think about who your audience is, and you want to learn about your audience and the amount, how, what cognitive resources they have. Probably that ad that we saw probably would have made people afraid at that time. Right now, I see it and I do a massive eye roll. I just go like, <laughs> <laughs> you think this is gonna work? <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, this is, this is true. It, well, at least for my generation, it's true. It, well, half of us don't even turn on the TV. Well, for those of us who were there in the 80s, it did work, let me tell you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Oh, thank goodness it did, but it does look pretty dated. I'm saying that it probably did work. People are looking for something work. different. Yeah. I think it, it probably it worked, worked, but, just... worked, but not, not, not now, not this generation. Well, we could just get Morrison bowling down Albanese. <laughs> no. Oh, well, there you go. Why didn't you think <laughs> of that, Paul Fletcher? Can I just pick up something that Simon said there? which was quite important, I think. He made the point that uh, for quite a lot of people, um, political issues are not top of mind. Uh, and the flip side of that is, as you know, is well known, a significant percentage of people don't make a decision until they actually have the how-to-vote card in their hand and are going in to cast their vote. Um, part of that is a corollary of the fact that we have a compulsory voting system in Australia. Um, our system is quite different to other countries uh, where the aim is to get the vote out, so you're appealing to the extremes, our system tends to focus on, on the mainstream and people who may not be that engaged, and I think that's a plus in our system, but I think it's one of the reasons why um, sometimes you can see uh, messaging which is designed to be um, uh, cut through and getting to people who may not be having that much of a focus. Mm. Should, should you be allowed to lie in ads, though? To Simon's first point, um, if you're selling toothpaste or beer, you can't, but if you're selling politics, you can. The, the issue here is uh, the implied freedom of political communication, which um, the High Court has found is uh, inherent in the Constitution. And then the question of, OK, if you're going to put any restrictions on political communication, who would actually be making those decisions and would they effectively be standing in the shoes of the electorate? Uh, you know, ultimately in our system... Uh, but a lie is a lie, you, you, you right? I mean, if, but, if you're lying sure, but if, but if you, sta you, you stand or fall on uh, the claims you make and whether they're effectively rebutted and uh, it's, it's, it's the electorate that ultimately makes that decision. And, the, and, and if, you're, if one party says something, the other party, uh, if it believes it's incorrect, has a very strong incentive, the means and motivation to get out there and say, well, that's not true, this is the truth. Catherine, you, you, yeah. you know, according to the polls, you may even be in office um, after the election. Would you look? Is that something that Labor would want to look at well, seriously? There's a couple of things. I, I want to take up Simon's point. Like, you know, seriously, you can't honestly tell me there's no puffery in advertising. So, you know, sure. that, like, you know, really. Like, but, there's, but there's, there's issues about, you know, Obviously, you can't make a health claim in advertising because that has some very serious consequences if you're trying to make a claim about that, and that's why there's regulations around um, that. Um, I think people are really discerning. And the example I use, I mean, I think um, Paul and our, our kids are similar ages. I'm a 13 year old, uh, you know, watching YouTube, TikTok all the time, and he has been absolutely inundated with um, Palmer United ads. You know, I think they're just everywhere. And he, he you know, says, like, why are people believing, you know, this rich billionaire? You know, why are they being conned by this bloke? And, like, he's 13. He can work it out. I think people are pretty smart and they see everything through a lens of this is someone trying to persuade me about something. Is it true or is it not true? So they, they, and they think, think so is... little of politicians, they accept they lie all the time and so no, you don't, I don't need a law against not, it. No, no, that's not what I'm saying, Stan. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is people have a discernment about what they're, what they're seeing. You know, they make a... You know, put it through a lens of their own lived experience and they make those decisions and use critical thinking skills. Now, obviously, you know, advertising is exactly that. We are trying to persuade uh, of a particular thing. We're trying to say, you know, our side is better. Uh, we, of course it is. Uh, but um, it is, our side's better and this is what we're going to do about it. So I think, you know, facts do matter, but I think also, you know, I think people are pretty discerning about it and, you know, we leave it, leave it to the electorate to make up their mind about those things. Caroline. I, I look at it from a legal point of view, and obviously I've, I've done a lot of corporations law. Um, if you make a misleading or deceptive claim to the market and it has a material impact on the share price, uh, ASIC visiting you pretty quickly. And, um, and we've, we've seen a lot of that sort of thing play out um, in the courts over the years. But And I do appreciate Catherine's point. How do you actually 
it, how do you actually regulate this if you do go to regulate it? It's the sort of thing where you would do the draft and you would as easily tear that draft apart and try it again and, and never really come up with something that balances it well. So I, th I, I always take the view of I'd prefer more speech than less speech um, and and to the extent that it can be rebutted, that, that is obviously the preference. The, the thing where it can be really mm. impactful is, well, one, does it have an impact? And two, at what stage of the campaign is it? I mean, if you were seeing that, you know, the, it's always the last week of the campaign that this stuff sort of comes out where there's almost no opportunity to rebut it, where if it is effective, that's where it can be a problem. And, and we saw that, I suppose, in a sense, with the Medicare in 2016, that there, that there was pretty reasonably effective. And, the coalition still hasn't scrapped Medicare. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, that they can be problematic. Well, I hate to be cynical, but lawyers, journalists, politicians yeah. and advertisers, <laughs> but they have any of us I know, right? <laughs> Yintifar, you're excluded that. tonight, <laughs> researchers. <laughs>